so we have this person called Aizal Mazar. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, so I'm sorry about that. But he has a long running channel and he talks about topics on ethics and veganism. And he has like 14,000 odd subscribers. He recently did a video that antinatalism is evil. That's the title. It's ruining ecology. It's ruining vegan movement. It is ruining everything. And in that, he criticizes antinatalism. While doing that, he uses a lot of ambiguities. I thought I should clarify those ambiguities, and that is why this response. Let us see what he's saying. Why is global warming a bad thing? Narrow down the focus briefly. Why would it be so bad if polar bears were to go extinct? Right? So we're not talking about a scenario in which the whole world is utterly laid to waste, but in which human beings are so irresponsible as to allow the extinction of polar bears, the total devastation of ecology, uh, the food chain at the North Pole, et cetera, et cetera, which is not hard to imagine at this point. It's not hard to imagine. What, what is bad with it? Do we ever sit around and follow? So what is bad with it? The simple answer is it is going to cause a lot of suffering to those polar bears. That is as simple as that. The ambiguity in this question is he's talking about extinction of polar bears. There are two distinctions. One is the process of extinction and then the state of being extinct. The process of extinction can happen in many different ways. It can happen in killing, like we kill all the polar bears. It can happen in um, ecosystem uh, problems, like we, what we, what's happening right now. The habitat loss of polar bears because of which they go through um, enormous suffering before going extinct. And the third is that for some reason, polar bears stop reproducing and then they go extinct. And I think the third way of stopping reproduction involves the least amount of suffering compared to the other ways of going extinct. That is one clarification. Talking about state of being extinct, if polar bears really do go extinct, why is it bad? The question is, it is bad for whom? If we are talking from human's perspective, we would not ever see such majestic animals anymore. And that is sort of an aesthetic loss for us. And therefore, it is bad for us. We can say that. Is it bad for polar bears themselves once they have gone extinct? A state of being extinct, can that be said as bad for the polar bears? I think no, it can rather be said as good because there are no more new polar bears being born who would be going through suffering. This is from an antinatalist point of view. So this question has so many nuances. All of these were glossed over in this conversation. Philosophize about whether or not life is worth living for a polar bear. That is another ambiguity, which is going to be a repeating theme of this video. And I will be repeating that. I'm sorry about that. But that's because this person is repeating that mistake again and again. He uses life worth living. We know as antinatalist. Life worth living can mean life worth starting and life worth continuing. And we as antinatalists are opposed only for life worth uh, only for life worth starting. We are not against lives which want to continue, which are existing lives which want to continue. We're not against that. That division was lost. He does not make that division when he says life worth living. Hashtag polar bear lives matter. Okay. Parts per million. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Why is this a problem? What are we willing to do right, in pursuit of a solution? Very rarely, perhaps never, do people discuss or debate whether or not human life is worth living, whether or not human civilization is worth preserving. <clears throat> the fundamental assumptions built into antinatalism, they vitiate, they invalidate, they overturn the entire ecological discourse. And ju just to get along with people, just to be friendly, we pretend that they don't. We pretend that uh, antinatalism is just another kinky lifestyle choice, that it's like BDSM. That is really how we act around it. Oh, cool. Oh, well, well, you know, I personally am not turned on by whips and chains, but okay, that's good for you. Oh, and and naturally, you never want to have kids. The majority of people you meet in BDSM. And that kind of thing. It, we treat antinatalists as if they're a bunch of swingers and as if there's no conflict. There's no incompatibility between veganism and being a swinger, between ecology and being a swinger. <laughs> True enough. right? And then, and then antinatalism, it's just another kind of eccentric, sexual deviant, self-indulgent movement. right? And it's not. 
I agree. I mean, I don't agree that it's a fetish or sexual deviation, but I agree that antinatalism is not a personal choice. It is not about a personal lifestyle. Child freedom, child free by choice, can be is, but antinatalism is not. And so, to that extent, I agree with him. We should talk more about it. Antinatalism is about a moral philosophy, a moral standing about a certain action is right or wrong, mainly procreation. The objective, the ideal outcome. that the BDSM movement exists for is not for everyone on earth to be in chains it is not for everyone on earth to be whipped and enslaved <laughs> okay it's not um the objective the ideal that antinatalism is in pursuit of is to reduce the surface of planet earth to being as lifeless as the surface of the planet mars as the surface of the moon is that's another ambiguity so the ideal the objective of antinatalism is to not start new suffering sentient being that is it now if as a consequence of that the all the sentient beings on this earth die out their own lives and there are no more sentient beings created and therefore the surface of the earth is reduced to a clear surface like surface on the moon and mars so be it that is one view of antinatalism there are some antinatalists who are also pro extinctionists in the sense they want extinction to happen and they want antinatalism as a means to that extinction that is another variation that is also true and then there are philosophers like mati hairi who say that these two questions are so interrelated they cannot really be separated so clearly Uh, we don't want to create new suffering beings and we wish that there were no more suffering beings sentient beings who can suffer on the surface of the earth this much is true but to take that and then to say that we want to reduce the surface of the earth to a lifeless surface like moon and mars is sort of a leap because the question which is unanswered is how do we want to achieve that how do we want to do that reduction the immediate thought that comes to mind is antinatalists want to kill existing lives and that is how they want to do it that is not how antinatalists would want to promote doing that in fact as i said antinatalism is not for stopping existing life that ambiguity was not addressed in this conversation now in practice how does this vitiate and invalidate the debates going on within veganism I had a conversation with another YouTuber. I am leaving him unnamed, partly because I don't want to misrepresent uh, his argument, and I also don't know to what extent he was joking around. We had this conversation. He, he may have been ten percent joking around. He might have been twenty percent joking around. Uh, as you're going to hear, I, I don't. Th- I do not think it's possible he was a hundred percent joking around or even fifty percent. But you'll 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 hear what this conversation was in in just a moment. Um, I, I think what this conversation reflects is a very large percentage. of people in the vegan movement today it is not the case that they are vegan and then by natural extension of veganism as a necessary corollary as a necessary implication you know that they decide to be child free to 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 not have children okay. the problem is instead that these are people who are in principle committed to antinatalism in in principle committed to ethalism the opposition to all uh, biological life and then in fact veganism is an extension of of that veganism is a necessary uh implication or or knock on consequence if you want to make a claim like this you would want to back it up with some kind of evidence some kind of survey some kind of statistics some research papers and the reason is different people go through different kinds of journeys to reach different conclusions at different points in their lives i know people who were vegan first and then became antinatalism i know people who were antinatalists and then became vegan i know antinatalists who are against veganism i know vegans who are against antinatalism so people have different combinations of journeys everybody goes through different journey so to make such a claim you would need some kind of evidence in form of statistics which i don't think he has provided if you were vegan first and foremost and only secondarily or tertiarily a sort of child free person a person opposed to having children oneself how could you possibly justify pet ownership How can you possibly justify taking a wolf and castrating it, domesticating it, training it 
so that it sits on the floor and watches you play video games. Okay, so many ambiguities in this. First of all, why does he have to ask this question only for vegans who are child-free or anti-natalists? There are many vegans who have children and have pets. That question applies to them as well. So what is specific about anti-natalists here? That's point number one. Point number two is the term pet ownership is very ambiguous. It can mean people who go to breeders, to pet shops, buy some pet, pay the money and get it. That's one kind of pet ownership. And I think most vegans and definitely most antinatalists are opposed to such kind of practice because we are breeding other animals for our purposes. So that is not the pet ownership generally vegans and antinatalists would support. The pet ownership would, which vegans and antinatalists would support is there are many stray animals on the streets living extremely horrible lives. The degree of the how horrible lives they're living can change from place to place. I do not know which country this person is. Maybe he's in Canada and maybe the situation there is not as bad. But here, the countries I have visited and the country I live in right now, which is India, the situation of stray dogs and stray animals and cats and stray cows is extremely horrible, very dire situation. So any help, anybody who thinks that, oh, I should rescue a particular dog, bring that dog at home, feed that dog, take care of that dog, take care of their well-being is a good idea. What is wrong with that? That is point number two. Point number three is the ambiguity of talking about wolves. He says that you're bringing a wolf into your house, domesticating that wolf and then making that a toy. That is not what is happening. These animals have been domesticated since thousands of years. If we were at the start of domestication, I am sure the principles of antinatalism and veganism would have opposed domestication of animals at that time itself. So the domestication he is introducing, the process of domestication has already happened. Now what we can do in practical life, people are uh, creating solutions for that. And one of the solutions would be bring a rescue animal at your home to take care of that animal instead of buying a new animal, which is completely horrible practice. So this argument of using wolves and then domestication, I don't think it's an honest attempt to put that argument. We sterilize or spay and neuter dogs and cats and um, I'm in support of spaying and neutering other animals also. But we do that and of course we cannot take their consent. They don't understand what sterilization means. So we pretty much do it forcibly. That can be said that we do it forcibly. I have practically been involved in sterilization, in forcibly catching the dogs by nets and getting them sterilized. They are put under anesthesia. Then they are, if it's male, they're castrated. If they're female, their ovaries are taken out and so on. So I'm practically involved in that. Um, we, from our side at least, take at most care that minimum suffering is imposed upon that dog or cat. That is why they're put under anesthesia and then the um, operation is done and then they are put under a, under a post-op care for about five days. So all of this is done so that because we are concerned about suffering of those animals, one. And second, we are concerned about the potential suffering of the potential beings who would be born if we don't do this. So it is completely in line with the beliefs of antinatalism and I would argue of veganism to sterilize these pets. It is not that we are castrating and sterilizing them so that we can have a toy. That is, by the way, another point. Most vegans and antinatalists do not get pet and do not treat that pet as an ownership. The relationship is not of an owner and a slave or owner on and a toy or owner and an object. It, it is not like they belong to us. We are caretakers of them is most of the times the relationship. And these are our companion animals. That is a relationship. So this ownership, pet ownership itself is a misnomer from that perspective. I think there is a kind of interesting debate to be had. In what way is life worth living for the whale, for the shark, ceaselessly searching the ocean for prey? Uh, in what way is, is the life of a polar bear something precious, something valuable, something meaningful, uh, something important? Hmm. So I think here he means life worth continuing. I'm granting that much liberty here that what he means is there exists a polar bear, there exists a whale 
and why is their life worth continuing to them but then when he starts talking about meaningful life that is where he loses the argument because the requirement for having meaning to life is a requirement only to humans other animals do not have a need for meaning in their life they are slaves to their instinct and their genes they keep on living they don't have any other way to do so they have to do that and they keep on running away from suffering that's all they've got there is no yearning for meaning or anything like that which humans have needs for okay but the life of a domesticated dog of the domesticated cat and when these animals are male we castrate them we deprive them of their all of their natural instincts as another ambiguity deprivation of natural instincts is different than the deprivation which we generally talk in case of antinatalist arguments and we'll look at that but uh, just remember that we are talking about deprivation of instincts here which is different because if a male dog wants to fight with another male dog for dominance stop 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 bad 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 boy bad dog right? dogs have to be constrained and calmed and punished and quite literally kept in chains so that they do not exercise their instincts their competitive instincts their their instincts to form a pack their instincts to hunt the instincts of large dogs to kill and eat smaller dogs by the way if you didn't know it's quite literally a dog eat dog or and of course their instincts to mate to reproduce and the effects of um, what's done to cats for example a female cat is removing their entire hormonal system all right it's just much more drastic much more dramatic than than uh, providing these animals with condoms or birth control pills in case you you imagine this is mere contraception no this is totally changing the uh, the character of of the animal the emotional character the instinctual character the behavioral uh, character of the animal and what most vets will say is oh but if we didn't do this to cats if we didn't remove the entire hormonal system then we we couldn't possibly keep them as pets that the the mate seeking behaviors the spraying behaviors the territorial behaviors the, the competitive instincts for both dogs because they are so extreme that these animals could not live in your apartment with you could not sleep uh, on on the carpet while you play video games uh, so on and so forth so 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 you know with it having been noted there might be something profound to say about the life of a, a polar bear um, swimming from iceberg to iceberg <laughs> forever and ever from one generation onto the next over centuries over millennia right as thousands of years. perhaps we have some philosophers new about this what philosophical justification is possible for a human being beating a dog with a rolled up newspaper so that it will forget that it is a wolf and imagine that it is a human created toy that it is a toy that it is a plaything that exists for your entertainment for your emotional gratification right so this playful this play with the dog I, again this is not the primary reason why we have pets why antinatalists and vegans have pets or should have pets the primary reason is to save them from suffering now you can call that as a deprivation of instincts we can question why such a deprivation of instincts is bad their own natural behavior that you have described to go and fight with other dogs to compete for sex to search for food have you even seen the life of wild dogs how they what they exactly do and um, why would you like you you can question why is that bad anyway so to deprive from them from all these instincts is not actually the primary reason either the primary reason is to protect them from suffering if in the process of that we end up depriving them from some instincts so be it why is that bad that is the question and these antinatalists i speak to to me hilariously to me mind blowingly astonishingly astoundingly they are pedestists they are in favor of owning pet dogs pet cats of having them castrated so on and so forth they they many of them own pets themselves they have you see their instagram they have a cat they have a dog whatever it is and of course they're in favor of going out and and castrating stray dogs and and stray cats yeah i mean i don't see what the contradiction here is 
I have been involved in going out and sterilizing in the stray animals, stray dogs. I have been personally involved in that. What is a contradiction that is perfectly in line with the argument for antinatalism? We are preventing coming into existence of new suffering beings, new sentient beings. What contradiction it is? You can say that we are imposing something on those dogs and I will come to that. But we definitely are preventing coming into existence of new beings, which is completely in line with antinatalism. So look, um, it's politically convenient for you, you antinatalist hypocrite. It is politically convenient for you to do this uh, to dogs and cats, whether they be owned by human beings or whether they be uh, free, feral, wild, uh, or, or what have you. Hmm, hmm. Shall we? Shall we play that game? Shall we play that game? Name the trait. So you tell me by what criterion this is permissible or morally positive to do this to animals and not to do this to human beings. Why didn't... That's a very good point and I want to address that, but let's hear out this first. We do this to members of ISIS. Why didn't we castrate all of the supporters of the Taliban in Afghanistan when we conquered that country? At the end of World War II, when the United States Army had its tanks rolled over Germany in one direction and the Russians rolled their tanks in the other, why didn't we castrate or why didn't we sterilize every German man who was a member of the Nazi party? What do you think would have been more effective? <laughs> effective altruism. What do you think would have changed history? Why is it that this is unthinkable when we do this? Series? Why is it that this is something considered perverse, cruel, barbaric compared to executing someone by putting a noose around their neck and hanging them? Why, why do you think that is? There's some kind of moral intuition. There's some kind of deep-seated philosophical presupposition built into our political systems, which is, yes, we can kill this person. We can give them a fair trial and execute them, but we can't torture them. We can't castrate them. We can't deprive them of the range of natural instincts, and we can't deprive them of the ability, the possibility of reproducing, of having a child and raising a child. That is something so important to us as... Okay, so... One thing is that I'm not going to address the topic of capital punishment. That itself is a deep topic. That is not the topic here. I'm going to address the main argument that if it is okay to castrate and sterilize other animals, why is it not okay to sterilize humans forcibly? That is a point I want to address. Before that also, I just want to point out that he mentions sterilization and torture in the same expression as if one th these both two things mean the same thing. But it is not. It is important how we sterilize these animals. That is why we have this infrastructure of giving them anesthesia and then taking care of them post-operation, all of that. So tor we are not torturing animals when we are sterilizing them. Of course, we are doing some harm to them because we have to catch them. They suffer many injuries, which are also treated as part of post-operation. But we are causing some, some harm. But to call that straightforward torture, just to torture is not correct. We take utmost care to minimize the harm while sterilizing the animals. That is point number one. Now to the question of why is it okay to sterilize these animals, but it is not okay to sterilize humans forcibly. That is the main point. Now, uh, Peter Singer, and I know many vegans don't like Peter Singer, but this argument still holds. When he talks about speciesism and anti-speciesism, he talks about the difference between equal moral consideration and equal treatment. Imagine that you are slapping on a rump of a horse. You just, you know, pat on the back of a horse. And the horse might feel something, but it's not going to be severe pain. But if you use the same force while slapping a human baby, that baby is going to pay, uh, feel a lot of pain. So even though we have equal moral considerations for individuals across species, that does not translate to equal treatment necessarily. That is point number one. Why is this important? Because we need to be aware of the differences between the species. So dogs can smell a lot of things. We cannot smell that much. Our sense of smell is not as good as dogs. Bats have a good sense of hearing. Our sense of hearing is not good as theirs. Birds have a good capability to fly. We don't. We have a good capability to think and think morally. Other species don't necessarily have that much capacity. So there are differences across the species. That is point number one. 
secondly as a result of that we also have a capacity to think about the future and this is a point peter singer has made in his interview with richard dawkins which was published on youtube many many years ago we have this capability to think about future we build a path of our of our life we plan for it we think that this is what i want to do tomorrow this is i want to do month down the line this is i want to do an year down the line this is i want to do after 5 years 10 years and so on we build something into the future that capacity also has a downside it has a downside that if those things are not achieved we feel deprived we feel harmed we are harmed because our preferences were not met and that causes suffering so we feel harmed the root cause of all of that is we have desires towards the future towards events and things that are going to happen in the future so if we don't fulfill those desires that causes a lot of suffering to us that is peculiar to our species as far as i know other species might have some capacity in the same in on the similar lines that other species also have some capacity to think intelligently but i don't think any other species comes as close to as human beings in terms of having desires for the future and causing suffering if those desires are not fulfilled so given this difference humans are the only species who have desires towards the events in the future and can cause suffering to them and therefore can be harmed if those desires are not met that is not what happens in the case of other animals and that is also exactly the case about having children about reproducing about having a sexual partner about having a life partner and so on and that is why we also need to have some kind of a right rights based framework we ought to respect our autonomy in this case because it can cause harm to other humans in this particular way because other animals don't have a desires towards the future events if we sterilize them even forcibly i am not talking about the harm that is caused in the process of sterilizing them while catching them and so on that i have already addressed i am talking are we causing any harm to those animals by depriving them of their future potential and i am saying we are not causing those because they don't have any desires at that present moment and because they don't have any desires there is no question of not fulfilling those desires we are not depriving them of anything and therefore we are not harming them and therefore it is okay to forcibly sterilize those animals whereas it is not okay to cross the autonomy of humans and forcibly sterilize them that is one of the reasons the other reasons and which is related to this is humans are the only species who at least we think have a capability of some kind of moral thinking they can think of right from wrong they have a moral agency other animals it can be said they have some primitive moral agency but again in comparison to human beings there is no animal which has such a developed moral agency therefore we ought to respect the autonomy of other humans and because of that difference we should not cross the autonomy of humans and forcibly sterilize them whereas it is okay to forcibly sterilize these animals because we are not harming them one and secondly we are saving them from a lot of suffering that is the argument here humans even in how we treat our worst enemies even though we treat the taliban even though we treat the nazis right we treat that possibility of having a child as more precious than life itself that your hormonal character in having testicles and not having a hysterectomy performed on you against your will if you're a woman not having a castration performed on you against your will if you're a woman we treat that as something more important than more precious than life itself we would not do that to our worst enemies in war not even world war 2 not even the the conquest of Afghanistan after September 11th not even in a war like September 11th wars that are frankly motivated by revenge we will draw so yes we would not do it our to our worst enemies if they are humans and because even though our hormonal system is built to reproduce 
that is not the reason the reason is we have this capacity to have desires for future events as i as i said and it is not present in other animals drop bombs out of an airplane and we'll fire bullets from a helicopter gunship but we won't castrate you oh and the exceptions are significant we have a history of the forced sterilization of our indigenous people here in canada the dehumanization of our indigenous people treating them as something worse than stray dogs now i've studied this in history of canada i have not studied it in the history of the united states to the south i have not studied it in history of the caribbean i've not studied it in the history of australia okay i haven't uh, around the world there will be other examples of forced sterilization campaigns against indigenous peoples yes we have that one in india as well in the decade of 70s there was a politician called sanjay gandhi and he did a lot of forced sterilization of men in indian villages he might have a good intention but he did them forcibly and that backfired politically the practical the utilitarian aspect of that is that that backfired so badly that even after india today is the most populous country in the world nobody dares to talk about promoting sterilization promoting vasectomies talking about population is very very you know no go area that is how badly that backfired but apart from that the it is fundamentally wrong to forcibly sterilize humans we recognize that i don't see any contradiction given what i've said <laughs> all right and i would encourage you wherever you are try to get familiar with this okay it is extraordinary it is an exception to the rule uh, of all the different ways we've had of enslaving and exterminating indigenous people and so on and so forth it, it is extraordinary to look at forced sterilization but it has occurred there are exceptions and again i think this reflects I mean, to say it's a taboo is an understatement this is much much more rare than torture execution massacre forced relocation concentration you know this is really extraordinary but yes sometimes in human history we have taken the step of of man treating a man in the same way that we treat farm animals and going ahead and castrating in the same way that we treat dog and when i presented this hypothetical to this other vegan youtuber what he had to say back to me is that he is an anti-natalist and he therefore regards this kind of sterilization positively when it's applied Yeah I don't know what kind of youtuber vegan antinatalism he was talking about but that is not the argument of antinatalism I don't think any serious antinatalist any serious philosopher of antinatalism or who is on the side of antinatalism would promote forced sterilization of humans so if you're taking a, as this person's opinion as a basis to criticize antinatalism that is not valid by the humans and likewise positively when it's applied to animals so he sees he justifies petism he justifies because of pet ownership and so on and so forth he justifies treating wild animals this way as positive because they are all steps toward that future ideal of planet earth being as barren and lifeless as the surface of the moon this so two ambiguities i've already addressed that we antinatalists would not support forced sterilization of humans antinatalists would definitely support forced sterilization of pets companion animals and stray animals when we talk about forced sterilization of wild animals though many different antinatalists disagree with each other there are nuances to this sterilization of wild animals is an extremely complex exercise if we ever have to do it it involves many different nuances so to club these three things together forced sterilization of humans sterilization of pets and companion animals and sterilization of wild animals to combine them in a single stroke is a massive generalization and i don't think that is right service of mars right any steps we can take to help our fellow man not exist to help dogs not exist lions not exist polar bears not exist he sees as positive because his fundamental objective is against the existence of life itself this seems to be the case like you know like how non vegans how meat eaters say i met such and such vegan and he said some such and such wrong arguments therefore all vegans are wrong and therefore veganism is wrong i am surprised that a vegan 
himself is making such an argument against another philosophy right their fundamental philosophy is that life is not worth living no the fundamental philosophy of antinatalism is not that life is not worth living it is that life is not worth starting once it is started that life might become worth continuing but no life is worth starting that is the fundamental philosophy of antinatalism okay again what is most fundamental in politics is very rarely what we debate and unsee explain it's very rare I, I, i've never in my life have i said to someone do you know why i'm vegan because i think life is worth living you know i am vegan because i want human beings to exist i am vegan because i want, want civilization to exist i want human civilization to flourish and have a future for the next 500 years 5000 years it never comes up it's never so i think what he's referring to is the environmental benefits of veganism again this is a confusion between benefits and the primary reasons like it happens for antinatalism too environmental aspects of veganism that it has a less carbon footprint that is more green that is more sustainable these are added benefits of veganism look at what founders of vegan movement have said in 1944 there wasn't a problem about ecology then there was no global warming at least to the degree that we see today then the main the primary reason for veganism was about animal rights and animal suffering so to say that i am vegan because i want humans to flourish and i want civilization to flourish is wrong on two fronts one is even if you don't be vegan considering the primary reasons for veganism the civilization would continue that is point number one the second point is the it is an, it is unanswered that why do you want the civilization to continue why do you want all these animals to continue being brought into existence as a vegan you are already opposing factory farming which brings a lot of animals into existence which would not come into existence if there was no factory farming it was there if there were no farmed animals many animals would not have come into existence so as a vegan what you're saying is it is good if those animals don't come into existence so how is that against antinatalism this is a, you know i tell you like why are you involved in stand up comedy why are you involved in the fashion industry why are you why do you care about clothes or shoes it's not going to occur you say oh well i actually think life is worth living <laughs> therefore i want human beings to have shoes so they can walk like you know what i mean you're not going to deal with it <clears throat> on this most on this most fundamental level what is most fun i think if you talk on individual level there are majority of the humans today are non vegans they are living their own lives there are many people in 70s 80s 90s there are many people who are 100 years old who have lived a non vegan life altogether have lived a happy life so your argument that you're vegan so that the their life can be worth living and their life can be worth continuing does not really hold this health argument is also is not the primary argument for antinatalism fundamental is rarely what is most important because in politics our focus always is on the difference we can make <clears throat> in the same sense that faith in the existence of god shapes the real world decisions people make including the question of whether or not they're going to have sex before marriage whether or not they're going to have a three way or a four way after marriage you know I mean, what they're going to do with their sex life these things are influenced very directly very powerfully by whether or not they accept the unproven hypothesis that there is a god watching them this premise the fundamental world view belief system built into antinatalism it shapes the decisions people make in their real lives in the real world it has tremendous consequences for us personally politically and in every other way Yeah it does have tremendous consequences and if you don't bring a child into existence because you're an antinatalist you're doing a very nice job if you're adopting an existing child you're doing even a better job if you're forced sterilizing or sterilizing other animals you're still doing a good job because you're avoiding bringing of new sentient beings into existence i don't understand what the problem with this is i do not think antinatalism is growing as a movement i do not think it is becoming more powerful as a movement i believe veganism is shrinking as a movement the veganism is becoming weaker as a movement that is collapsing it will 
Another claim which needs to be backed up by statistics that veganism as a movement is shrinking and anti-natalism as a movement within that is shrinking. But let's take it on its face value. There are real quantitative indications of the extent to which veganism is shrinking. It is becoming smaller, it's becoming less powerful. And this is related in a complex way to the extent to which we as vegans have discredited ourselves. So the Let's see if he provides any evidence in the description here. Ecologists are eager to embrace anyone who will embrace them back. But to what extent people are concerned, vegan, otherwise this, that, my Patreon link, then searchable list of my videos, find me on Instagram, not only my YouTube channel, but here is another channel. And if you're looking for answers to the questions, why is the comment disabled? Okay, I'm not looking for the answer. So no. No statistical evidence provided to the claims that he's making about vegan movement, about vegans, about antinatalism and antinatalists. The power and significance of antinatalism is thus greater and greater in relative terms compared to the vegan movement. Now, I'm not going to refute that because there is no evidence either way. But what I'm going to say is that the primary reason antinatalism has such a big overlap with veganism, why there are so many vegans who are antinatalists and why there are so many antinatalists who are vegans, because they are, in the on the terms of arguments, so similar, so same. When you are opposing factory farming or farming of animals, what you are essentially opposing is creation of new animals. The animals which are already created will die, whether you slaughter them or whether they die of natural causes or whether they die of disease. Whatever the process, they're going to suffer in the process and die. That is eventual that you cannot stop. What you're opposing as a vegan really is opposition to creation of new animals. So by such an opposition, what you're saying is prevention of their suffering is better even if that means we don't bring them into existence, which is the argument for antinatalism. That is one. And then when you say that we should consider members of all species equally in terms of moral consideration, then we should also consider the human beings in the light of this. We should look at the suffering that humans have to go in their life and think that is it worth imposing this suffering onto somebody who doesn't exist. If they don't exist, they are not going to suffer. But if they do exist, they are going to suffer. If they don't exist, they are not going to be deprived of the potential pleasures of life. So it is better not to bring them into existence, which is the same argument that we have applied for farmed animals or the animals who are in the farms and who are treated even humanely. So that is the reason why there is such a big overlap between these two movements. There is a logical sleight of hand in the most basic premise of antinatalism, which is this, any, any, any political problem can ostensibly, but not actually be solved by stating, we would not have this problem at all if we just didn't exist, okay? So the current war between Israel and the Palestinians, what's the quickest and easiest solution? <laughs> The antinatalists are going to say dead serious, dead pan serious. Oh, well, well, the solution is antinatalism. If all of these people simply cease to exist, then there's... Very important point. Antinatalists are not saying that people should cease to exist. That is not the solution they are providing for the war. For the existing wars, I'm talking wars, but we can use it for other um, unfortunate situations. For the existing war, what antinatalists would say is, it would have been better had the people who are at the war not existed, so the war would not have occurred. No ant serious antinatalist or the argument for antinatalism is saying that these people should cease to exist. Very important difference and I am really sad and disappointed that such a difference is glossed over. There's no, more, there's no question. <clears throat> How would you like to resolve the war in Ukraine between uh, Vladimir Putin and, you know, and Joe Biden, let's put it that way. Oh, well, antinatalism, that'll clear that problem right up. <laughs> Again, antinatalism is not a solution for present problems in the sense that it is going to solve the problems. Those problems would not have arised 
had these people not come into existence is the point and therefore antinatalism is talking about future problems that all the future problems the wars in the future can be prevented if people don't come into existence i don't know why it is hard so hard to understand <laughs> so you know water pollution you know this conditions us not to really think of water pollution as a problem that can be solved it can water pollution is not an insurmountable problem the cost of rent minimum wage you know what have you but you know i think most significantly right now in 2024 carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and i don't think antinatalists are opposing the solutions to the existing problems in the traditional way most of the antinatalists are against global warming they're concerned about environment they're concerned about water pollution they're concerned about all these political problems he is talking about in the same way that other people are concerned and they are promoting the same solutions that other people are also promoting so it is not an antinatalism is a solution to these problems in the sense they should cease to exist we are only talking about future people and future problems these are people who are committed to a worldview that in their mind they leap to the logical conclusion the solution to carbon dioxide uh, pollution climate change these other problems is simply to have fewer people or of course none at all no time has come the time has come to say explicitly that life is worth living again life worth living life worth starting or life worth continuing and life is worth living for civilized intellectual human beings and the word intellectual here makes an arrival uh, we need to be careful about when we bring intelligence and meaning in the mix of suffering and life is worth living for wild animals giving free reign to their full range of instincts life is worth living okay life is worth living for wild animals given their free range of instincts how how do you decide that i mean these animals have they question like are, are they saying that my life is worth living i i i cannot derive it from their behavior like the way we can derive other things about whether they're feeling pain or pleasure i don't think how can we do that so whether their lives are worth living whether their lives are worth continuing is a question we cannot just solve by just saying that we let them behave as per their instinct in fact if we look at their suffering i don't think this person has looked at their suffering as much as antinatalists would have considered but if we look at the suffering in the nature and there are many quotes by learned evolutionists like richard dawkins uh, 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 charles darwin to talk about the horrible suffering that exists in the nature so if we look at their suffering it is in fact easy to infer that it would rather be better if they were not existing to go through that suffering especially they would not have deprived of the pleasures had they not existed for a polar bear on an iceberg and i will be the first one to concede that life is not worth living for a domesticated animal for a wolf that has been mutilated castrated domesticated beaten and broken so that it can be a plaything so that it can be an ornament well we have already uh, defeated the argument that the plaything and the toy is not the primary reason to have those pets so now considering that we have rescued those animals brought into our homes we are taking care of them they are not suffering as much as they they would have on the streets why are we saying their life is not worth continuing to the life of a bipedal ape a human being okay not all life on planet earth is worth living there are some lives so terrible that it this i agree in fact if you look at the nature if you look at the suffering that goes on in the nature animals are being eaten alive they are being eaten from inside by parasites there is always a danger of disease they are always competing for resources they are competing for sex and food they are hunting each other it is a horrible horrible game of as some people have said gladiator wars so i would rather derive the inference that 
it's not a life worth living for those animals given the suffering that they have to go through would be preferable to embrace an early death and i think that does not mean that we should kill them because killing itself brings up a lot of questions but we can definitely infer that their lives involves such a degree of suffering that it would have been better had they not come into existence in the first place that much we can definitely say the easiest available symbol for this is the life of your own family pet the life of a cat the life of a dog the life of an animal that is forever denied the only happiness it can ever experience again this is an ambiguous term denied the only happiness which it can embrace and i think what he's referring to is the instincts of um, sexual instincts the instincts of being in a pack and instincts of hunting all these natural instincts which we have cut off of these domesticated animals he's talking about that and he's saying that there is some happiness which comes through fulfillment of those instincts which we have denied these animals i think to an extent i can agree also i would question whether that is happiness or whether that is something else but we have cut their instincts off is that bad is it causing harm to that animal as against prevention of suffering which would have caused through these instincts to these animals that is a question and i think we are not harming these animals they uh, these animals they have instincts but they don't have desires towards events in the future they don't have desires that i am going to fulfill these instincts behave as per these instincts to achieve something in the future they don't have that desire so if there is no desire there can be no deprivation in the sense of deprivation of pleasures or deprivation of preferences and therefore we have not harmed we have in fact benefited these animals this bookshelf behind me <laughs> it's all kinds of happiness i can get the books on the shelf that a dog can never experience the only joy a dog can experience is to be a member of a pack of wolves to explore the wilderness to seek out its prey to kill or be killed and not necessarily to reproduce not necessarily to have children uh itself but to compete with other members of the pack so to kill or be killed is the happiness that we are depriving these animals this is clearly the case of fallacy of appeal to nature for the opportunity to have children that is the only life that is fit for a wolf and we are the one species on this planet that can truly transcend that that can truly transcend the life of the body the life of the instincts we can transcend the ecological niche we were evolved to inhabit and i am deprived of nothing by being cut off from the forest from the jungle um from running around with a spear trying to kill wild animals right <laughs> yeah because you don't have those desires so being deprived needs the desires first of all and then unfulfillment of those desires so if there are no desires you cannot be deprived and we have established that these animals because they don't have desires we are not depriving them of anything <laughs> whereas the antinatalist perspective is that only on the surface of the moon only on the surface of mars is there a perfect absence of suffering i am at the well that's true i mean you can't deny there is is there any suffering happening on the surface of the mars or moon it's not so the that statement is true but the context around that that then how to achieve it is something which was wrong here the opposite extreme where you can say i am a, a cognitivist pro natalist okay i feel that the planet mars has no reason to exist and that if it were to collapse or explode it would leave the universe no poorer we would be losing nothing and lacking nothing if this one red dot should disappear from the sky precisely because there is no intelligent life on mars what the antinatalists see as the that is human arrogance if mars was to disappear the universe would not lose anything that is true but if earth was to disappear the universe still would be as indifferent as in the case of mars to think that universe 
is going to be at a great loss because earth did not exist because these intelligent humans vanished is is just the case of human arrogance the highest ideal of a planet totally uh, lacking torture totally lacking suffering and misery i see the other way around as a planet totally lacking intelligence yeah why does that matter a planet totally lacking intelligence why is that bad if there is nobody who is going to suffer as a result of that intelligence why is that bad and i can say likewise if the planet earth had had no intellectuals on it let's set the bar really high here <laughs> if the planet earth had no intelligent life or even if it were only inhabited by mindless people what if the only life on earth were as mindless as the great white shark or as mindless as bacteria you know bacteria do have some intelligence it's been proven it's been studied exactly how much intelligence you know these tiny microorganisms have you know what if the whole world were just a cycle of suffering of a shark blindly following its own passions and trying to kill as many prey animals as possible before it is one day killed itself whether a shark be killed and eaten by a larger shark or it be killed and devoured from the inside out by the tiniest of bacteria that is a meaningless cycle of suffering okay and that is the reality today humans have been around for i don't know how many 200000 years out of 500 million years of evolution evolutionary period of multicellular organisms out of 4 billion years of the life of the solar system and earth and out of 13 billion years of the life of universe only 200000 years so that is what the reality is it is the cycle of meaningless suffering and humans have done almost nothing to improve it other than improve their own situation but that is not our situation as the only creatures with advanced intelligence on this planet this planet exists for us how arrogant can you be i i you are a vegan this planet exists for us what does that even mean that presupposes some kind of purpose that somebody somewhere created this planet to serve you this is almost like a religious sentiment this planet does not exist for you you are nothing you are just a cycle of cause and effect and by you i mean not personally you i mean humans in general who have this kind of arrogance so this planet exists for us is absolute arrogance we give it meaning you know we can give meaning to our own lives that much we can do we are capable of and that is our need unfortunately other animals neither have the need nor have capability to give meaning to their lives and what this proves is there is no overarching cosmic meaning to this life it is for us to find in our own lives what is meaningful it is for us to create a meaningful life and yes it is for us to take on the responsibility of so the fact that you have to find and create your own meaning tells us that there is no ultimate meaning to this life the only value is the negative value of suffering in the life i would hazard a guess i mean other philosophers might disagree that there are intrinsically valuable things like knowledge and intelligence as he says but i think the main or basic value is negative value of suffering presiding over the animals that exist in the wild including the polar bears at the north pole ultimately the reason why we have to preserve the polar bears of the north pole the ecosystems that are on this planet is that it would be despicable it would be immoral for us to destroy them well why i mean i'm not for destroying them again another ambiguity by the way destroying them killing them involves a lot of suffering i'm not saying that we should but if they stop existing in some way or had they not come into existence what would have been wrong other than our superficial deprivation of some aesthetic laws and if they eventually die out through extinction 99% of the species by the way are extinct and all the species will be extinct in eventually which exists today but if they go on and become extinct eventually by non creation of new beings and not through killing what is wrong why should we keep on preserving this 
because it is dis despicable and because it is immoral that doesn't seem to be an answer enough so this question needs to be answered for the sake of a cheeseburger diet yeah we should not destroy them for the sake of a cheeseburger diet that does not mean that we should keep on preserving them for the sake of preserving them we can still have another third option so this is a false dichotomy the only happiness that can exist for the dog for the wolf is the pursuit of its prey in the forest but the only happiness that can exist for you and i is the pursuit of a more meaningful life but that is completely irrelevant first of all only happiness that exists for the animals that happiness is in the in the present moment they don't have a desire for future happiness so if those desires are not present we are not depriving them of those happinesses that's point number 1 and secondly for humans whatever the happiness is i don't think antinatalists are saying that we should not pursue those happinesses antinatalists only are saying is that we should not create new beings you know the taking on of greater and greater responsibilities i might say philosophically politically and other which i agree we should take on greater and greater responsibilities we should take the responsibilities of other animals and make sure that they don't suffer and make sure that new suffering beings are not created was our forest our jungle now with the intelligence that we've ended up with uh as a species right the purpose of that is not to search out ceaselessly our prey in the jungle or in the ocean casting a net off the side of of a fishing boat okay there is a better life for us right seeking out meaning as a student as someone who learns as an author as an artist as someone who creates yeah seeking out meaning is a purpose of our life that can be a purpose of life because we have the need for that meaning but in the process of finding out that meaning if we are creating new beings who will then be in need of seeking out meaning we are in a cycle we are in a ponzi scheme so seek out all the meaning that you want build all the local terrestrial meaning that you can have and be happy I think no antinatalist is against that. Antinatalists are only against creation of new beings who will in turn be in that need of seeking out meaning. meaning, right? And seeking out a kind of responsibility that a wolf and a polar bear can never know. A kind of political responsibility, a kind of philosophical responsibility for the future of our own species, for the future of the whole planet, for the future also of these ultimately blind mindless creatures that inhabit the fringes of the wild yeah very nice sentimental speech at the end but it means nothing it is still mindless we can seek out all the meaning that we want nobody is opposing that only opposition which antinatalists are putting is creation of new beings who would then be having that need of seeking out new meaning again that is the opposition that antinatalists are doing